Hello, Blogging Heads Nation. Uh, welcome to this monthly uh, update of Dresbert. Uh, I am Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I am now the uh, author of the Spoiler Alerts blog uh, at the Washington Post, Post Everything. And I am Heather Hurlbert at Human Rights First, and uh, today um, I will be taking comments and suggestions for how I should get myself into the 21st century and what kind of headset slash better earphones I should get um, to avoid having this charming ear accessory that I have at the moment. Um, yes, I apologize on, on you know my behalf if I'm at all in any way responsible for this, but clearly despite our president repeatedly saying that we live in the 21st century, uh, our tech ambitions occasionally uh, let us down. Right. Well, having worked for the president who said we were on the bridge to the 21st century, I feel like yes. I'm holding the bridge to my ear at the moment. <laughs> but ah. anyway, speaking of presidents, um, our president gave a speech today. Yes, he did. Uh, it was supposed to be a foreign policy speech or was a foreign policy speech. Um, and it got the full Obama administration rollout, which is to say Ben Rhodes kept talking to every single person in the media uh, about what it was going to be. Um, Heather, what was your take on the speech? So I have, I have two takes on it. Um, okay. And one is that, yes, it was absolutely necessary to give a speech at that level of generality because it has proven so difficult to get into the national discourse, the idea that there is anything between, as the president said, going to war and doing nothing that so many of the policy options that you and I taught ourselves blue in the face saying that the administration should do, you cannot get anybody to talk about or write about or reflect. And, you know, the, the gap between the richness of the sort of academic and wonky and advocacy discourse about all the options that you have to be active in the world and the way it gets presented as, you know, either we can send um, the Navy to the Black Sea or we can do nothing – um, so from that, like this was a speech that was necessary and welcome at the level that it was given because it's like that, that point of view, even though it's the point of view from which American foreign policy is run and for which Americans voted twice is so absent from the discourse. On the other hand, it's intensely frustrating to have sort of a speech at that level of generality as opposed to, and so here's what I'm doing about X, or here's what we did yesterday about X, or here's how we're going to solve, not just talk about any more X or the thing that we've promised to do four times in speeches over the last year. Here's how we're going to do it this time. Um, yeah, I'd even be harsher than that. I was actually really, really deeply disappointed with the speech. Um, you know, so I wrote in at the post about what I would have liked to have seen him do uh, before the speech came out, which is to say, you know, you're right that on the one hand, on the level of generality, you, A, he needed to give a speech about this because there's this accusation that you know, he's reticent to use military force. And if he's reticent to use military force, what else can the United States do uh, to exercise leadership in the, the world? And also, I think, to counter this sort of widespread perception that the U.S. is a passive actor uh, in world politics now rather than the sort of shaper of world politics, that in a whole variety of, of issues, be it Ukraine or the South China Sea or Syria, that, you know, basically the United States has decided it's not necessarily going to do all that much. Um, and I think Obama needed to counter that. And I think, to be fair, he could have made an actually decent case for the sort of criteria out there for when you want to do something not involving the use of force, but rather action short of force to nevertheless chart a path. But if you're going to do that, you got to do two things. The first is you have to actually articulate what you're talking about short of force, uh, namely the kinds of forms of economic statecraft that you and I can talk about until we're blue in the face. Um, and the second thing you have to do is say, what will the sort of long-term plan be if, let's say, countries like Russia and China do not agree with us uh, in terms of U.S. leadership or the sort of purpose in which we sort of articulate for the world? Um, and he didn't really do either of those things. Um, it was appalling to me that he gave a speech about how the U.S. is supposed to lead and didn't once mention either the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, um, because these are ways in which you can actually exercise leadership that do not involve the use of force and yet didn't really come up. Um, he sort of referenced a few international institutions, but, you know, he kind of did it half-heartedly. I'd say the other thing was, I'm curious about the, your, your take on this. His speech struck me as extremely low energy. 
he didn't really seem to be into the speech all that much. Um, so three things. Yeah. First, um, it's always wrong to have particularly high hopes for a commencement speech. <laughs> and, you know, this was not a policy speech at Brookings. This was a commencement speech. And so right. sort of first and, and you do in a commencement speech, you do have to sort of care about the audience. And particularly if it's a commencement speech to people that you're asking to go off and take a bullet on behalf of their country. So I think, frankly, some of the hopes that you had were, were misplaced given the, given the, the format. Um, to your point about why weren't um, the trade um, the trade initiatives mentioned, you know, number one, um, it is a bunch of 21-year-olds, um, 21-year-old military cadets, you know, folks that are not going off, at least not right away, to work on Wall Street. So I would guess that somebody probably wanted to put them in and was then told, no, 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 not for this audience. Um, also, and maybe you want to comment on this, um, you know, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership in particular seems to be a bit bogged down at the moment. So They're both bogged down. Yeah. Um, no, there's, there's no denying that. I mean, I, I push back a little bit on the notion that because he was speaking to West Point cadets, he couldn't bring up these things. I mean, you know, George Marshall talked about the Marshall Plan at a Harvard commencement address. Uh, you know, commencement addresses are perfectly appropriate places to talk about uh, longer foreign, you know, larger foreign policy visions. I mean, I think the, the most, the way in which I do think that acts as a constraint is you don't want to go on too long, um, which I think is entirely understandable, uh, particularly if you're sitting in an audience wearing gloves. Um, but in some ways, you're right that these trade agreements have bogged down, but that, but part of that issue, you can argue part of that is due to Congress, but part of it also, I think, is due to the fact the Obama administration has put almost no weight behind these things. Um, and I think in some ways, this is the biggest disappointment I've had with this administration, you know, this year, which is, you know, after sort of provocations in the South China Sea, the East China Sea and, you know, Ukraine, that's one of those moments where, in fact, you know, you would say, OK, there's now some external threats out there that are actually pretty serious. We don't we're not saying, you know, there's it's going to escalate into a war or something, but there needs to be actually some sort of institutional response. Ergo, we should actually sort of jumpstart these agreements a little bit because that's better than, let's say, bringing Ukraine and NATO, which would be a disastrous move. I think you and I would both agree. Um, and yet that's not what the administration did. They they really sort of let these simmer on the back burner. Um, and also, but more generally, I, I do think it would be appropriate, even in a West Point speech, to talk about what you're going to do short of force precisely because, you know, your goal is to say, Look, we don't think force should be used unless America's vital interests are at stake. And by the way, this is what we are going to do to make sure that America's vital interests aren't necessarily going to be at stake. Um, so I, I do think you could have segued into that, and yet he chose not to, or his speechwriters chose not to. Yeah. Well, I can. I must say, I can see that argument. I can also see the argument that you needed to march through and make the make the argument about what not to do in in a number of places. So, and then by then you didn't have any more time. Um, I want to push back on you though a little bit on the trade agreements piece um, yeah. because. You know, a significant reason that the European one has stalled is, frankly, European discontent with the U.S. over the, the various NSA disclosures. Yeah. So it's not clear to me that there's some way that somehow Obama could have leaned into this and, and fixed that. Um, and similarly, you know, I, I, you, are, you are more of an Asia trade geek, certainly, than I am. But, I mean, some of these disputes with Japan... You know, it, it's interesting. I mean, the argument you make goes both ways with what's yeah. going on in the South China Sea. It's interesting that Japan doesn't want this deal more badly. Um, no, I think that's a fair point, which is to say this isn't strictly about President Obama. I agree with you on that. Um, and again, I, 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 I said this in the post. The thing that's striking to me is that the sort of NSA revelations have slowed down TTIP far more than Ukraine has accelerated it. I um, mean, in some ways, that's that is a new thing about you know that that didn't used to be the case. You know, during the Cold War, you could argue that it was the specter of the Soviet threat that caused both the United States and its allies to eventually agree to a whole set of sort of economic integration agreements um, because they knew what the enemy was, um, or because they knew what the the adversary was. And this year, that hasn't really played out. That that um, you're right. That you know, in part, it's been. Uh, you know, Germany and Japan and others who have resisted these agreements. It's also, though, been, you know, Republicans in Congress uh, that that's had something to do with it. But I think the other thing that Obama could have done would have been, in fact, to have said either to have made some more concessions towards the Germans 
on, let's say, things like investment tribunals. Um, you know, that would have been one thing. Uh, you know, another thing would have perhaps would have been, in fact, to establish a more firm deadline uh, for finishing these negotiations as a way of sort of incentivizing the negotiators to say, look, you have to get it done by this particular point. Um, and, and the third thing I would say is it's not just about the trade deals. I don't mean to say that that's the be all and end all um, of what the U.S. can articulate in terms of foreign policy. It would have been more interesting also to hear, frankly, how he plans to, let's say, reinvigorate NATO. And yet there was just really sort of a lot of bland talk on that paragraph. Yeah, I mean, so to agree with you and also sort of ironically to circle back to why the speech was necessary and the core ideas in it are actually good ideas. If you look at the EU's response, you know, the EU says we see what you're doing under the NSA as more of a threat to us or as too big of a threat to us to be pushed aside by what Russia is doing to its neighbors. So the you know, sort of extreme vacuum cleaner war authority responses that the U.S. has to terrorism and security threats are are, are disserving us. Um, and, you know, the, a president can't say that for several reasons, but I do, it is an interesting demonstration of, you know, exactly what, what the point of the speech was. Now, of course, you know, when, I mean, the thing that struck me as sort of odd and problematic is when a president gets up and says, well, you know, we've got to get to transparency on our target of kindling programs. Well, um, who's we? Yeah. Um, and it is, it is a remarkable thing to see this president, you know, having, there were things in that speech that, that he has said that the U.S. will do several times now without apparently being able to, to move to move the security bureaucracy to, to making them happen, or frankly, to get past Congress's desire that they not happen, as in the case of closing Guantanamo. So, you know, ironically, the things that the reason the things that you were missing from the speech are missing from the speech is yet another argument for for why it was necessary to give. Um, just another little a little gossip tidbit that you reminded me of is I was Ooh. when this speech was first described to me by air quotes an insider a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was told that it was going to have a heavy emphasis on international institutions. And actually, I had forgotten that until you mentioned huh. what a light emphasis on international institutions it had. Yeah, that clearly got I mean, don't, he, there was, you know, there was one paragraph, uh, you know, that was sort of devoted to it. I mean, there was a, there was a section to it, but it was very vague and there was nothing, you know, again, it, it, there wasn't much to uh, to hang your hat on on, on that part afterwards. Um so it's simultaneously encouraging and discouraging to hear that he was willing to focus more on that, but it got you know edited out in in the in the process. But in some ways, the, the, this goes back to a slightly deeper point. Partially, this is also the audience that the speech is directed at. Um, as you say, the thing about the speech that did strike me is that the one thing it resonates with at this point is pretty much the state of American public opinion when it comes to foreign policy. Um, I mean, the line that that Obama gave that got without question the strongest response. Uh, in the audience, and I suspect at home as well, was his suggestion that this would be the first West Point graduating class that would not have to go to either Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and that's clearly the attitude of the American people at this point. And, you know, generally articulating a, a foreign policy that might actually resonate with the American people is not the worst thing in the world. Um, but what it didn't do, you know, if you're an ally, either again in the Pacific or in, in Europe, and you're seeking reassurance that the United States will be there for you. This was not a speech you wanted to hear. Um, cause I think in terms of the reassurance function, it didn't do that job at all. Now maybe, I mean, he's going to Normandy and maybe that will be the second part of this, but you would have wanted at least seen a faint in that direction in the speech. And I didn't see it. Well, you know, two things. One is Biden also gave a national security focused speech today. And I think that, um, will have had considerably more of, of that. And the other thing, and you know, this is, um, I have already been asked that reassurance question by reporters today. And, you know, at a certain point, yes, the allies want to be reassured. But frankly, the thing that should be most reassuring is that that a president is not going to go off and start dumb wars and waste resources and, and political will someplace else. You know, that, and, and I guess my point, Heather, the way I guess I would put this is, is that you're absolutely right. But there's something that's striking to me. It's a low bar to say that this administration's signature achievement in foreign policy is that it is not engaged in a massive clusterfuck. Um, 
that's not nothing. Don't get me wrong. I, I, you know, particularly given some previous administrations, that that's great. But that really is at this point what its main claim to fame is on foreign policy. Well, as I think I argued the last time we we talked, you know, so if you if you think about sort of the last sixty years of American administrations, and you eliminate at, at minimum you eliminate Johnson, Nixon, and, and Bush the yeah. second, maybe you eliminate Kennedy as well, um, in terms of you know not being engaged in a massively foolish military enterprise, then. You know, it puts you. It puts you in the top fifty percent. Um, but oh, Heather, come on! No, That's, no, no. But more I, than that, I mean, I do, I do think. And what's both most hopeful and most, you know, potentially disappointing about about this speech is that it's sort of what are you setting the table with? You know, okay, you you cleared you cleared the dumb wars off the table. Um, yeah. You cleared the misbegotten objectives off the table. What are you setting the table with instead? And, you know, interesting things about the speech really laying out pretty strongly the case for an Iran deal, which, you know, said to me that they're feeling they're feeling hopeful that they're going to have an Iran deal soon, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, really reshapes how how we think about security in the Middle East in an interesting way. As you say, the trade deals potentially reshape some things in an interesting way if you get them. So, you know, we're we're at an inflection point where it's quite possible that we wind up, you know, three years from now saying, oh, hey, yeah, actually, there's this and there's this and there's this. And we can see that, you know, the table was set for the future in some really positive ways. Now, to get there, you do have to go from giving speeches to to really visible and vigorous implementation, you know, as I as I said at the beginning, and that that would be my critique. Right. And I mean, in some ways, the other issue is whether he's actually going to be able to get Congress to buy in on whatever, you know, on some of the things that he's going to want to do, you know, not just the trade deals. But, for example, if, in fact, he does, you know, if a, if a deal with Iran is signed, he's going to need Congress to actually approve the lifting of some, most of the sanctions, if I'm correct. Well, the, I mean, the, the Iranians are well aware of that. So and many of the sanctions have some um, administrative discretion, which I grant you Congress has tried to get rid of at various times. Yeah. So, you know, the, the de a deal will be premised around things that the Iranians are confident that a president can do. Now, there is also a move in Congress to set something up so that Congress could vote down an agreement, um, which you know, is an interesting interpretation of the Constitution. But hey, if you could pass it. Um, so it may yet be the case. I mean, you, you definitely have to have congressional acquiescence, whether you mm -hmm. have to have, whether you actually have to be able to win an affirmative vote is less clear. I mean, similarly, there was a move um, in the Senate last week to institute a requirement that Congress be able to vote up or down a presidential plan to close Guantanamo, which, you know, again, clearly, you know, President the, President Bush decided to open it on his own. You know, President Obama really ought to be able to decide to close it on his own. Um, so you you do have um, you know that kind of interest in in putting the brakes on things, but there remains, uh, frankly, a lot of stuff, and again, a lot of ways that the administration can take actions that make it harder and more costly for for Congress to decide to block him. Can I ask you? I, I want to ask you two things on this, Heather. Um, the first is whether or not – I mean, again, the, the thing I was struck by watching him deliver the speech as opposed to just you know reading the text is the extent to which really the, 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 this had a second-term feel to it, for lack of a better way of putting it. One wonders whether or not you know, there's a degree of sort of second-term exhaustion that kicks in. And this is true of any administration you know, in year five, six, or seven. Um, and and you know, whether or not that's in part what's going on. And you'd think I'd remember what the second thing was I was going to ask you was going to be. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start on that on one that and you can, you can think about it. You know, when you yeah. commented that you thought he seemed it, it, it lacked energy, that reminded yeah. me when Obama went to West Point in 2009 to give the speech announcing the Afghanistan mini surge. And at the time, it was interpreted, I mean, I think there were some exhaustion conversation then too, but I, it was also interpreted, and I think correctly as, this is Obama's deeply serious I, commander in chief. I have to send people to their deaths 
mode. And I think, and this is a little bit of pop psychologizing on my part, that he adopts that that mode of, of speaking to really make sure that he is making a complete separation with anything that might seem like a campaign persona. Okay. Uh, you know, I just, yeah. I think that's how, I mean, you just, this is not the first time that, that that comment has been made about him giving a national security speech. And I've never heard it said that he delivered a domestic policy speech in an, ex, a quote, exhausted, unquote, way. So I just think there's something else going on there. Okay, I will I will accept that. I think the other question is whether or not you think the sort of second term team is capable of executing whatever vision it is that that uh, Obama has going forward. I mean, you know, I don't know if you saw this thing that John Kerry said about Edward Snowden, um, the man up comment. Did you hear about this? You know, I, this is one of these things that again is it. it you know, happens like once every month when where where Kerry says something that I honestly find inexplicable, um, because if you read the full text of that quote, it's basically Snowden saying, or it's Kerry saying, you know, it's obvious that you know he's committed espionage and and you know he's just hiding out in Russia, so he should just man up and come home. What part of that statement does anyone think is actually going to convince Edward Snowden that he's going to come home? I mean, it, it, not to mention the man up language was particularly weird. So John <laughs> Kerry, I mean, that John Kerry, that is about John Kerry and nothing else. That is not about second term. That is not about exhaustion. That is okay. about John. That is about John Kerry and a microphone. <laughs> and, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as to the dynamics that might lead um, somebody who is a combat veteran and has the resume that Kerry has to feel like he needed to, you know, impugn Snowden's masculinity, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Um, I just, as you say, that is completely mystifying. Um, I do think in any administration in a second term, um, you get a shrinking of the inner circle, which can be a problem, and you get a fatigue level which can be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think there's some of that going on with these guys. Um, it's something that happens to everybody, but that's, that, that doesn't, has nothing to do with John Kerry. <laughs> John Kerry, John Kerry. So in other words, you're just saying it's, it's just his own unique. You, you can't ascribe that to the second term. That's the, I will accept that. That is a, a, a potential fair point. Um, I guess the the other question I have, or the, the thing that, bothers me and here i will shamelessly put the cover of my book in front of the camera so i have a book coming out in uh i believe the official release date is next monday called the system worked uh how the world stopped another great depression um and it basically argues that despite many excellent reasons to believe in the fall of 2008 uh that the open international economic order was going to fall apart and we were going to have a second great depression we didn't that didn't happen um, and to be fair, it didn't happen in no small part because of the actions of actually both the Bush administration and the Obama administration. Um, and yet again, you know, we're going to – this this goes back to the economic uh, aspect of, of the Obama administration. But again, you want to talk about a, a set of policies where it really does seem like the administration is just going through the motions. I mean, it's not it, – it, they could – in some ways, if the administration were actually to ab able to accomplish – what it had set out to do, namely TTIP, TPP, um, you know, its energy uh, program, um, even, you know, bilateral investment treaties uh, with China, investment or immigration reform and so on and so forth. This would actually, you know, accumulate into something relatively significant. Um, and yet it seems very clear this administration does not want to talk about any of this, if at all, until after the midterms, that this is um, – the, the part about all of this in terms of this being sort of foreign policy week for the Obama administration that, that stood out to me was this Politico story where basically they, they list what the administration is doing this, you know, this week. And then the sentence is and then Obama will not talk about any of this until after November. Um, and on the one hand, I, I again, I understand the notion that uh, the country doesn't necessarily care about foreign policy as much as it does about uh, domestic policy. But. You know, this is one of those areas where I do think presidential leadership actually does matter. And I'm someone who's picked on the press for, you know, talking about leadership as this sort of vague mantra thing. But what policies you're going to prioritize as a president really, you know, that is actually an exercise in leadership. 
Well, Dan, I think you're wanting it both ways here and you have to pick or you don't have to pick. You and I are in the happy position of not having to pick, but they have to pick. And so, you know, the question is, do you do you shape your public message around sort of your platonic ideal of what the best policies are? Or do you shape your public message around what you think will get you the Congress that can that you can work with on your policy priorities next year? And if you think, as I do, that, you know, at least on um, the, I, I mean, ironically, on the heart, on the security side, you're going to be much better off with if the Democrats hold on to the Senate, um, you know, in terms of, of counterterrorism policy, um, in terms of Iran, um, then, then, yeah, I mean, I don't like it, but I absolutely support a strategic decision that says you want to shape the arc of your public communication between now and November with the things that you think will help Senate Democrats hold on to their seats. And if you judge that not to be national security, then, you know, again, as I say, I don't like it, but I, um, I don't feel like criticizing it. Well, I mean, on the one hand, again, it's a fair, I, I, I get the argument. On the other hand, there is part of me that begins to wonder really, in some ways, it, let me put it this way. I think, you you know, the, the Obama administration might want to have it both ways because you can't simultaneously say that these aspects of foreign policy, you know, the public is, you know, uninterested. You know, the public cares much more about domestic policy, which is fine. But if that's the case, then you should be able to push for these things a little bit more without there necessarily being much of a blowback. Um, and furthermore, it's not obvious to me what the administration can do to actually improve its 2014 midterm fortunes. I mean, this is both, you know, in some ways beyond my my. Uh, Mario of expertise, and you being inside the Beltway might know a little bit more about this. But it's not obvious to me that the administration actually has a positive plan for how it's going to keep, you know, the Senate in 2014. Well, two things. You know, one is the real trick is that for the president, just like for us mortals, there are only 24 hours in the day. So right. every time you are out there talking about trade policy, you are not out there talking about the war on women. Um, or you are not out there talking about unemployment benefits or, and, you know, and then the way that a White House can help its party in midterm elections is to try to reverse the trend for the base not to get out there and vote. So what the White House can do is focus on things that will excite the base to get out and vote. And, you know, that ain't our stuff. Ah, uh, yes, our base, all 500 of us. <laughs> No, you and you and I aren't the base. Mm -hmm. At least you're not the base. No, unless, I'm certainly least, not the base. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unless uh, you've, uh, unless you've, uh, unless a zombie has come and gotten your formerly independent. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, you know, as someone who does think that the foreign policy stuff actually does matter. I mean, again, I've actually been someone who normally thinks, fine, the American public should not actually care all that much about foreign policy. I have no problem with them being rationally ignorant about this stuff. I do have a problem with, you know, the administration in some ways totally catering to that as opposed to occasionally pushing back. Um, and this was a speech that struck me as almost totally catering to it rather than pushing back. Um, and I think that's well, what I'm... Well, I completely disagree with that, actually. Okay, here because, we go. And I, well, I think, you know, there was um, sort of an extended critique on Twitter about how the speech was too cliched and didn't have anything new in it, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yes. But that's only true if you're us and you think about this stuff all the time. And if you are an intelligent no, but normal person outside the, the seaboards or, you know, just even on the seaboards, but th th does, this doesn't enter into your life, nobody ever says to you, hey, you know, we have this amazing array of economic implements that we can use to get our, you know, to get our way around the world. Um, that just does not enter into your consciousness. It doesn't feature on the TV news. It doesn't, you know, frankly, it doesn't get on. You know, even the sort of so-called more intelligent, you know, if you watch the Sunday shows, you won't yeah. see any discussion of it. So that stuff, it's not, you know, what I always tell people about the the sort of the more messaging-y aspects of the work I do is just at the point that you, the communicator, are getting excruciatingly bored with the message is the point at which it starts to get through. So, <laughs> you know, by that measure, if we all thought this speech was a little, a little, repetitive of stuff we all think we knew already, then then it did right. 
That's one possibility. I, w- I would push back and say, you're, on the one hand, you're right, and this is a, an arrogance that occasionally I have to, to check, which is, you know, when you hear the same rhetoric over and over and over again, as you point out, you know, you think it might be nothing new, but as you as you correctly know, he's going after an audience that hasn't necessarily heard all of this before, or hasn't heard it, you know, uh, in a long time. That said, there are ways in which you can make articulate the same message in a more interesting way. If I had to hear, you know, the sort of false dichotomy structure of a speech on terms of foreign policy one more time from this administration, I really am going to go crazy. Um, and, and that's the part where is that a promise? Is that a promise? <laughs> where you go, will you go crazy? If I if um if I if I call somebody at the White House and suggest <laughs> that they do another false dichotomy speech, will you go? Will you promise our audience to go crazy on this screen? Oh God, that's a that's a tempting uh, that's a tempting dare. Uh, no, no, no. I should not have said. Uh, uh, what would crazy even constitute in the man in the in a blogging head's world? Um, uh, viewers, you can tweet in suggestions about what what Dresner crazy as opposed to Dresner not crazy would look like. I like that. We'll call that hashtag Dresner crazy. That's good. That's an excellent suggestion. I look forward to uh, our blogging head uh, uh, audience suggesting possible ways in which I can look loony on uh, on blogging heads, which is actually not that far removed from how I normally look. Uh, but, but let uh, me ask you a question about your book. She said. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's related to this because if. Um, you're making the argument that the Obama and Bush administrations together actually did some things right and yeah. saved us from then. How does that square with the argument that they've disastrously failed to do much of anything, which you were making earlier? Well, I would say two things. First of all, the book primarily focuses on sort of global economy. It doesn't focus on, you know, security world and so on and so forth. And in some ways, for the last, you know, the concerns in terms of this speech deal much more with security than they do with economics. Um, so that's that's answer one. Answer two is, is that part of the thing I, fl- you know, I, I, part of the frustration that caused me to write this book is that while I do think the administration did a lot of things right, um, the widespread perception of that is actually incorrect. And indeed, the concluding chapter of the books, you know, uses as the analogy, uh, the sort of domestic analogy, uh, the TARP program that uh, started with the Bush administration and finished with the Obama administration, which represents simultaneously a major policy victory and yet a political disaster, um, which is to say, in terms of policy, TARP wound up not costing a thing and, and in fact, you know, actually netted the government uh, a great deal, of, uh, a significant amount of money, not to mention, you know, save the the U.S. financial system. Um, and yet, if you take a look politically, you know, the old John F. Kennedy line about victory having a thousand fathers, but defeat being an orphan. TARP is an example, and in some ways, more the, the more global responses that I talk about are also examples of cases that are policy victories and yet remain political orphans. Um, and so I think what occasionally frustrates me about these sorts of speeches is that they're just not better because or that they don't they fail to shift um, these sorts of not just public perceptions, really, but in some ways sort of elite perceptions uh, that the world is falling apart. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with your diagnosis of the problem. And I will note and I have to scoot off to a meeting. So um, this is maybe a, a one more exchange is a good place to, to yeah. wrap us up. But but um, I would no, I, I it is my view, you know, this administration is so good at communicating in a campaign context. Um, and I would argue and it'll be fascinating to see how the next administration does this, whatever, whatever stripe it is. Um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure we, as, as a political establishment, I'm not really sure we know how to communicate this kind of thing anymore. Hmm. Um, faced with the, the, you know, the media where you kind of have the 24 seven ability to break down any message that is sent out, but you don't have the 24 seven ability to be out there defending your message because you also have to govern and you also have to put out other messages. So, you know, I look at this complaint across issues and, and, you know, to some extent, um, I think you see it in other societies as well. And I'm just, I'm becoming a little bit of a pessimist. And this, you know, is from the point of view of somebody who used to write speeches for Bill Clinton, a guy who knew a thing or two about how to do this. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm becoming a bit pessimistic that w- we are actually capable of, of transmitting, transmitting and making stick complex messages in real time. 
Uh, I share your pessimism on that, and that would actually be an interesting. Uh, we, we should have a follow up conversation about that on blogging gets um, as to whether or not that's possible, and maybe you know as the campaign, the 2016 campaign heats up. Because you're right, the thing that's frustrating about this is that actually, as you say, this administration has been pretty good, you know, on, in campaign mode. And even if you want to go back to the Bush administration, they were actually pretty good in campaign mode, uh, but lousy at articulating uh, once they get into government. And so I don't think this is a unique to the Obama administration problem. All right. On that depressing well, note. <laughs> until next time. And um, we uh, everybody should uh, go out and buy a copy of Dan's book to fund his retirement plan. Please actually know, think about my child going to college, uh, which is what I'm primarily concerned with at this point. <laughs> uh, but till next time, Heather. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.